Well, hello, welcome to this week's Dividend Cafe video. We are actually recording in our offices in Newport Beach. It looks like a little different setting. I'm uh, next door to my own office where we have built out a kind of podcast and, and recording studio. It's still in motion, still new equipment and things getting all set up, but our communications department has, has kind of taken this to the next level to try to just give a better quality of our recording and, and it's a statement to how serious we take these weekly, both podcast and videos we're doing. Um, well, I'm a little more casually dressed today. I'm going to be leaving after the market closes today for like a six hour board meeting of nonprofit I'm on the board of. And so uh, a little more comfortable, but that's not to say that markets have been comfortable this week. I have a real specific thing I want to talk about today. So I'm going to kind of delve most of my time into that one thing. Um, but before I do this sort of setup of the market is as we stand right now, the market was down like 30 points on Monday, up 50, I think, on Monday and down 30 on Tuesday, up 150 Wednesday. Right now, we're literally dead flat. We're in the middle of the day, Thursday, dead flat. And so, you know, we're up a little bit on the week, 150, 200 points. But you might look at it and say, think that it's actually been a real non-volatile week because each day hasn't had much movement from the open price to the close price. But the fact of the matter is, that we were down 700 points on Monday and came all the way back. We were up 400 points on Tuesday, but lost all of that. So intraday, there's been a significant amount of volatility, but then closing prices versus opening prices are not reflecting a lot of volatility. But that intraday volatility is reflective of the same environment we've been in, even though last week it was delivering plus and minus 800 point, 500 point days every day. And that is a lot of uncertainty and a lot of um, directionlessness in the market. I stand by at this point, that 24,000 to 26,000 range of the markets, the Dow right now is at 24,600, let's call it. Um, and, and we've come down around the 24 mark and we've gotten up around the 26 mark. But since that point in October, early October, when this market correction began in which the two-headed monster of Fed and uh, fears of uh, excessive tightening from the Fed and fears around the trade war um, not improving, not and in fact accelerating into worse place, that uncertainty around those two things, um, we have just stayed within that range of 24, 26,000. I think we're going to stay there. The fundamentals are too strong to significantly dip below that. Uh, it's dangerous to kind of be saying that because if you're wrong, you're wrong. But And then I don't think that there is an argument bullish for a real movement much above 26,000. So you end up in, because of just where earnings are and the uncertainty that lingers around trade. When you get through that, I, I believe we have another leg to go in this bull market. And I think in the meantime, you have a range-bound, volatile period uh, where a lot of dividends get reinvested at very lovely prices. Okay, so let me talk about this issue of the price movement, price deterioration. I have a section at the Written Dividend Cafe, which now you actually have to go to this week because I'm only going to talk about this one section in Dividend Cafe, but in reality, it's a very long one this week. And I go through a lot about the drama in Europe, a lot about Brexit, a lot about business investment, different topics that are very relevant to markets. And they're all going to be laid out at the Dividend Cafe podcast and at the written dividendcafe.com. Um, so check that out in the other mediums. But for our time here in the video, I, I talk about this notion of how an investment manager, and, 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 and I'm one of them, can approach the reality of, of unknown components in markets. And that there's the, the well-known serenity prayer. It talks about uh, having um, the serenity to accept the things you can't change, the courage to change what you can, wisdom to know the difference. It's sort of a life principle. There's a lot of real uh, wisdom, obviously, in it. But I'm saying specifically in the investment management world, knowing the things that are manageable or forecastable or somewhat controllable and not knowing the difference is a very important thing. And I believe that there's three major categories of how people approach the reality of market uncertainty and how they want to deal with the inerrant volatility and the, and the risk involved in markets. And one is a sort of hyper-passive approach. View everything as unknowable. 
everything just sort of works out through time. Stocks as a broad asset class deliver a certain return. So do bonds. So does international. Whatever the different asset class may be, blend it all together and then just set it and let it go. Keep fees minimal, make very few changes, and, and don't worry about individual companies, for example. And, and, and that's a real, almost an extreme side of passive investing, but it's a hyper common one. I, I think it has a certain degree of laziness to it. There are some who would argue in favor of that approach intellectually, that have a very, very high regard for efficient markets. Um, and the inability of people to add value, but their point being everything is unknowable, unforecastable, uncontrollable, unmanageable, so don't even try. That's fine, that's one theory. Now there's another extreme that I think I, I would actually argue is probably even worse. And that is the notion that one believes everything is manageable. That there is this person out there or this process or this system by which we can actually forecast, presumably with some degree of accuracy and success, what PE ratios are gonna do, what geopolitics is gonna do, how market sentiment is gonna move things in a particular, I don't know, a month or a week or a day or an hour or a minute. It's never real clear to me what uh, folks who, who advocate for this sort of omniscient investing believe is the time period in which one can validate really impressive results. Um, and so they take a whole category of things that, that I very clearly believe are unknowable and unforecastable, but it seek to try to manage around that. The approach that we take is neither option one or two. We, are, we don't believe that there's nothing in the way we manage money that we cannot, through research and through work, um, gain some sort of an edge in or advantage. And, and we don't believe that everything out there can be researched and edged and, 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 and advantaged. We think that there are things that are intrinsically unknowable. But the th so we choose to focus on active management around the things that we believe uh, thorough work and research can gain some particular um, advantage in studying the income statements of companies, monitoring their free cash flow, um, looking at the cyclicality of earnings, um, looking at the balance sheet of companies and the indebtedness so that one can stress test what certain scenarios may do to their ability to grow earnings or to fund R&D, or in our case, to continue dividend sustainability, dividend growth. So it is, uh, uh, but this is the, another thing I got a, a layer on top of all this. We also possess what we call the constrained division, which is a term I borrow from Thomas Sowell uh, that he applies to a political philosophy. But we are completely accepting of the fact that even in the more um, uh, selective management of what we are attempting to do, even that is not infallible. Cannot be infallible, would never be infallible that there's the ability to research and, and, and study something and yet you will still get some things wrong. And so net net you end up across a whole portfolio with a real good advantage to deliver a long-term result. And yet there will be certain decisions on the way that don't go your favor, you don't go your way. And we use very traditional risk management tools to work around that, such as diversification and asset allocation. The way in which we weight asset classes, the allocation, we're gonna we're gonna be uh, uh, basically creating balance in portfolios that are appropriate to a given client, and then with an individual stock selection or investment selection, the diversification enables us to avoid blowing up when when something may go wrong or uh, input is misread or an application of an input is misapplied and so forth and so on. A lot of this stuff is, is tricky and heady. I may have lost some of you already, but I hope not, because it's very important, and I'm actually, believe it or not, really trying to make it very simple. There are those that believe nothing can be managed. There are those that believe everything can be managed. And what we're attempting to do is manage what we can manage and not manage what we can't. I don't care what P.E. ratios are going to do in the next two weeks or two months. And by the way, if I did care, it wouldn't matter, because I don't know what they're going to do, and neither does anybody else. 
and anyone trying to game what they think is going to happen to market multiples is insane. It is unknowable, it is undoable, it is unworkable. If I thought that I could accurately forecast how market multiples, PE ratios, valuations would move in short-term windows, then I would do it. I am paid as the owner of this business off of fees that are directly correlated to the success of market portfolios, client portfolios. So not only would I attempt to do so with my own money, I would attempt to do so with clients' money if I thought it could be done. I don't not do it because I can't do it. I don't do it because no one can do it. And I'm using PE ratios as one example. Um, the fact of the matter is there is a lot of inerrant unknowability in the short-term sentiments of markets, and I accept that. What is knowable are the things, this is where that serenity prayer analogy comes in. I want to focus on the things I can know. And I think I can know about free cash flow generation. I think we can know management's alignment with shareholders as it pertains to their philosophy and practices of return of cash to shareholders. There are things like that that are, are appropriate to factor into a calculus of decision making. That's the way we're approaching this. So when somebody says, well, how didn't you, how, why didn't you know the market was going to go down in, in the first two weeks of December? Or why didn't we go do this, do that? First of all, I've never had somebody ask that question who themselves was not wanting to do the same thing two years ago or 50% ago, okay? And this is what you're going to face. I've been telling you this for years and years and years since the recovery began in, in March of 2009. That at some point in time, and we're not even close to it yet, but at some point in time, we're going to get a bear market. And bears that were predicting a bear market 300% ago are going to come and go, see, I told you so. And these are like the worst human beings on God's green earth, okay? The fact of the matter is, uh, bear, that kind of perma bearishness is not a different investment philosophy. Those are just, it's a flawed form of humanity. Um, uh, sociology that has gone uh, deficient. What I am referring to is an economic outlook that has to make on a daily basis risk reward calculations on behalf of clients. And to the extent that I want to overweight in those decision makings <clears throat> factors that I cannot know that no one else can know, or, um, I believe I am creating, I am committing malpractice. But I also don't want to underweight the work that does matter the ability to go successfully adjudicate over time what companies will compound their free cash flow return to us. Those are the things I've chosen to focus on. Option one to my earlier paradigm is a much better quality of life for me. I set a portfolio. I do believe through time asset classes may end up kind of working out. And I just sit and tell people to ignore volatility entirely. We're trying to manage it within a bandwidth of manageability, of realistic manageability but um, not, not uh, take on a sort of sovereign role in the way the various nooks and crannies go. So finally, let me close with this. What about someone who goes, hey, well, I did forecast it. I felt uneasy, and I got this right, I got that right. You know, first you got to filter out the ones who are lying, and that's the vast majority of them. And by lying, I mean lying often of omission. They're tell maybe they did get something right, but they're not telling you all the other things they got wrong. And, and the analogy of the guy in Vegas who seems to have never lost money is a great analogy here. But let's, let's actually assume someone's telling the truth. Uh, the one in a hundred person who's not telling um, a, a sin of omission or commission. Uh, I can't even tell you how dangerous that person is. Because that person has been fooled by randomness. To use the expression or of the book uh, that Dr. Nassim Taleb wrote many years ago, had a profound impact in my understanding of capital markets. False noise, false signals, um, and, and everybody's a genius in, in these types of situations, and they fail to understand what was the real uh, provocateur of their successful outcome. So my words of wisdom in the markets we're in is that everyone needs a cogent investment philosophy. I'm very convinced that we have one at the Bonson Group. Um, I'm also convinced that we'll make mistakes in our application of that philosophy from time to time. But overall, the, the uh, hard work that goes into executing our philosophy is work I'm committed to versus the hyper-passivity. But the humility of avoiding hyperactivity 
where I am being active in spaces that I just possi cannot possibly know, intellectually or sentimentally or temperamentally or, or economically or anything else. So avoiding hyper passivity and, and avoiding hyper arrogance is at the core of our philosophy and I hope this all makes sense to set these different paradigms. Uh, read DividendCafe.com this week. Um, reach out to us with any questions at all. I'd love to say it's the holiday season and we're all kind of checking out, but it's it's not really, it's not feeling that way for me right now. We'll get to our kind of holiday cheer in another week or two, but for now, uh, this is pretty intense time and we're doing our job. And um, I, I encourage you as part of our job to reach out with any questions or concerns you have. Thank you for listening to this week's and watching this week's very lengthy Dividend Cafe. Thank you.